So welcome everybody. Today we have Cara Jane Heyman and Cara is everything. <laughs> you do, you kind of are. Um, Cara is a clay artist, a teacher, and she's the organizer of the Polymania event. And she is currently the president of the British Polymer Clay Guild. So welcome, welcome. How are you today? Good, thank you. So I started with yoga this morning by the lake. So that was a good start to a day. I think that's absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Um, so tell us about the British Guild. What's your what's your elevator speech about the British Guild? What do you, what do you tell um, people about it? Weirdly, I don't have one. I really should by now because I've been president for a couple of years. Um, the Guild's been going for 25 years. We've got our 25th anniversary celebration um, in September, uh, which everybody is welcome to join us for. It's going to be a, a sort of open session rather than just for our members. Um, it's changed a lot in the last few years because of COVID. We used to have uh, lots of regional groups that had meetings and occasionally would have a big workshop where people sort of traveled a bit further but we'd never really been able to include everybody because the UK is quite big it's not as big as the US um, but people in the UK don't travel like they do in the US you know when people talk about oh I'll just drive to Las Vegas or whatever in the US we would go what right. you know traveling more than an hour seems to be a bit of a barrier to a lot of people right. um, so with COVID and with the with Zoom, we've enabled um, a lot more stuff to go on. Um, we've got a lot more happening. We've got a lot more interaction, and that's been really nice to do that. So we've got about three, well, we've got 311 members as we speak, which is quite a few. It is a lot. That's a lot. A lot to manage. Um, so what's the mission? What's the mission of the? What's the? What's the? I mean, obviously. We love clay, but what's the mission of the British Guild? So it's to promote polymer clay as a, a creative art form. Um, so we try, I guess a lot of our work is trying to reach out to new people. Um, and so we do a lot of going to exhibitions. In the UK, there are a lot of big sort of craft exhibitions where um, people go and sell craft supplies. So it's not um, people selling things they've made, it's people selling beads and clay and, and so we often have tables at those events and they, they can be really big events with you know hundreds of thousands of people coming through and we'll have a team of volunteers there demonstrating and with a beautiful display of lots of things that have been made and sort of the variety of things you can do with clay to try and pique as many different interests as we can so a lot of the work we do actually isn't really for our members it's and and i think a lot of those people will be a while before they filter through and become members but we're hopefully opening the possibility of clay to as many people as we can and then our other mission is to try and sort of educate and elevate um, people's polymer clay skills so we do a lot of um, we've got a private members facebook group where people ask questions and we do quite a lot of signposting to sort of tutorials or to products uh, we try and have workshops and just try and we're sort of trying to do a bit more sort of businessy things if people are interested so one of our recent workshops was about photography um, about taking photographs of your creations um, but just yeah try and try and elevate the people who are who are starting and, and and help them build their skills but to try and yeah reach new people and and bring more people over to the dark side of polymer clay <laughs> dark side yeah it cracks me up. Maybe it should be the light side, really. The light side, yeah, the lighter, or the lighter side of polymer. Ooh. <laughs> so, um, you've you said you've been a president, the president for a couple of years. Yeah. And how long is that term? Uh, I we don't really have a fixed term. So you're stuck with it forever. Slightly <laughs> worries me. Um, I didn't ever really intend to be the president and uh, the previous president said I was vice president and I was happy to be vice president back up president and she said I'm thinking of stepping down would you like to take over and I said no I don't have time um, and then unfortunately circumstances forced that she was no, no longer able to and then of course as vice president you have to step up um, and so I was just going to do that until someone else would take over but um, 
I did a lot of rearranging. I like things to be super organized. And so I kind of made quite a lot of changes and, and knocked things into shape. And then having done all that, I'm kind of like, okay, I can do this. Um, but I mean, yeah, there's, I've got a great team of people that work with me. Um, that there's a whole load of people who kind of kept it going for years and years. There was a few years where things were a bit difficult. And this is, you know, technology has made life easier. Um, mm -hmm. As the years have gone on, it's easier to run the guild because we've got Facebook, because we've got the internet, because we've got email. Right, right. So what is the biggest challenge that you have faced when you came on board? What is, what, what's been really difficult to manage? The worst thing, and, I, and I'm sure you'll know this, is getting people to get involved. Um, so getting people to help, because um, when I think when I started, we had about five or six kind of key committee members, and that was about it. And we do quite a lot. Uh, we were in the middle of building a new website when I when I took over as president, and we were trying to change our membership subscription to be an automatic thing rather than very manual and labor intensive for the volunteers who do that. Um, so it's trying to find people who would help in the committee, but actually also getting the people who are members of the guild to interact with the guild. And, you know, we would we'd do a competition and only, you know, we at that time we had about 200 members and still only 20 people would enter. And it's mm -hmm. kind of, we're going to the effort to make these things happen. Like, mm -hmm. please people just, you know, give us something. Right. That's that's been a. I mean, it's still an ongoing struggle. Um, I've got a much bigger group of um, on my committee now. I think we've got oh. eleven of us. Um, Jennifer's one of them, um, and we sort of dragged her there. She didn't really want to, but we made her. <laughs> it works. It works. She's uh, she's a useful person to have around. She's got some good ideas. Thank you. She does. Um, so that helps having more people. But yeah, just trying to build a conversation and I think I think it's coming gradually and our our um the sort of social media people I've got two people who do all our social media across Instagram and Facebook and they both put a lot of time in and you do seen some of our posts and they they post all the time and that really makes a big difference mm -hmm. um yeah I was going to comment about that because the the Instagram in particular is just um, that's where I see it more. Facebook kind of hides things. You don't see things on Facebook for some reason, but um, your Instagram uh, page is a profile is really, really um, active and valuable, full of really, really good information. They do a great job finding finding interesting things. Yeah, they do indeed. That's and Margita tends to do most of that for us, and um, Debbie does a lot of the, the Facebook stuff and she does uh, in our private members group, she tends to do a post nearly every day. And so sometimes we have a theme for the month. So this month our theme is beads. Mm -hmm. So she'll be sharing tutorials or articles or inspirational posts or asking questions. Um, and that's still, we don't get an awful lot considering we've got 311 members, you know, she'll post a, a, a question and maybe two or three people will comment. So why do you, why do you think that engagement is low in these situations because this is this is true i think for everybody everyone struggles with this every every group and organization says this why do you think it, it happens i would say people just don't have the time they just you know i think people are scrolling through looking and i'm sure people are absorbing the content but they just that yeah don't necessarily have the time mm -hmm. to, to sit back and comment and i know with with sort of volunteering people are nervous that they're going to get roped in over there over their heads and end up doing a lot more than they asked for. So I, I kind of understand that as somebody who has been roped in over. Yeah, yeah I say more than yeah. I asked for. Um, but you know, we're, we're, we're quite nice and we try not to burden people and we try to share it. And but I, yeah, I think, and I think probably the world almost is a bit more passive now with, with the internet and with, you know, people are used to scrolling through Facebook mm -hmm. or just watching YouTube. Whereas I guess in the old days when we had a lot more face-to-face -face meetings, mm -hmm. you kind of have to make the effort to go to the meeting. And then when you're at the meeting, you talk to people, but online, it's quite easy just to sort of sit back and, and be an observer rather than an engager. Well, what I've noticed is that as you're scrolling, you, you do that motion of the next to the next to the next, and it becomes where that satisfies your need to connect. 
it's like that that gives you the little hit of dopamine to go like that and that and then you don't feel the need to engage further it becomes that feels too much like hard work when in reality all you're doing is engaging but it just and also i think um i've noticed that it's so difficult to type on a phone it's easy to swipe but it's difficult to type on a phone so then you're like and you don't so yeah so what what strategies have worked for increasing engagement uh offering prizes (laughs) that works um and interestingly we find sometimes we do a monthly draw every every month and and it's it's just a draw there's we don't it's not a you know competition it's just you have to do something and sometimes it's just put your name down Mm -hmm. and we get a lot more entries for that and sometimes it's show us a picture of your polymer clay stuff including chalk pastels Mm -hmm. and we'll get less entries if we do that um Mm -hmm. it's just you know that that extra step having to find a photo but you know we've had some great prizes and we'll have um maybe 50 members take part sometimes maybe more maybe more but you still think you know that's still only a sixth of people and there's a great prize and all you have to do is put your name mm-hmm. but, um, yeah but so we'll when i was on it when i was in the uk um and well i've been there many times but um when i was um when i went around and talked to a bunch of people in a bunch of different guilds i, I remember that the british guild at that point this has been a few years ago probably six seven years ago at that point um i i remember that the guild was pretty stagnant at that point and there was a, not a lot going on and then i i remember there was a whole bunch of renewed attention and i think lizzie got involved in a fair bit of that um lizzie buckler hold yeah. and but I remember at that point, the, there were several, like you had mentioned earlier, that there were several groups around, around the UK. Um, do those groups still meet? Are they still a part of the British Guild as collective? Or have yeah. they pretty much fallen by the wayside? They're still there. We've got less. So in fact, I was thinking the other day that actually the British Paul McClay Guild is a little bit like the IPCA in that we are the overarching for the whole of the UK and then we have the regional groups. The difference being that the regional groups don't generally charge any membership or, and some of them, the members don't have to be a part of the guild. It depends on how they're set up. We haven't enforced that. Um, so before COVID, we had 20 regional groups. Possibly That's a lot. Wow, um, considering how since, small the UK is. Since COVID, we've only got about 13 and some of those aren't very active. Like my own group, I just don't have time with being the president of the guild and all my other things that I do. I just put a message today, in fact, in in my local group saying, I'm so sorry, we haven't had a meeting. Could somebody else please take over organizing meetings? And, Mm -hmm. you know, I just don't have time for it. Um, So the group is there, but it hasn't actually met for a while. But yeah, we still have 13 and I think probably more will pick up again. It's just... It was very difficult during COVID. A lot of people didn't want to do Zoom. Um, the, the Guild as a whole has a Zoom account that we make available to the regional groups if they want to host Zoom meetings so they don't have to pay for Zoom, they can just use our account. Mm-hmm. Um, some groups are meeting on Zoom, still some have gone back to real life. We've, we have lost a lot, but I think there was a massive shift and, and I think the, the Guild has become very different in the last few years. And it, it's been since I've been president, but I don't think it's all about me. Well, it's definitely not all about me. I mean, there was a lot of change because of me, but a lot of it was because of COVID and because of Zoom. Um, and so we sort of thought, well, you know, everything's rubbish. A, a lot. I'm, I'm friends with a lot of Polymer Clay teachers. I knew a lot of them just didn't have any work. And so we arranged to do sort of Zoom workshops and that sort of changed the guild we've got a few more international members now because that because before we didn't do any you know an international member would have had a newsletter from us and that would have been all whereas now they can join in 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 our zoom workshops um and we and i think that the zoom workshops mean that people there are people who weren't members of the guild before because they couldn't come to a regional group they were quite remote or or they had some reason why they couldn't travel or a lot right. of our members are carers and so can't necessarily right. get away whereas if it's a zoom workshop they can 
possibly join or because we record a lot of them they can then um you know catch it later if they can't make it live so mm -hmm. it's become a lot more valuable to people because the technology has allowed us to offer this so that brings to my next question what are some of obviously covid changed everything um a lot more than we even realize i think and um it and a lot of the changes are um it's taking a while for them to become evident. Um, so what are some of the biggest issues that COVID brought for the Guild? So, yeah, I guess, I mean, face-to-face -face meetings were out. Mm -hmm. um, we were planning on having a retreat. We've never had a retreat in the UK. There have been workshop events, but never a retreat. And we were, we were all set, and this couple of us really fired up. We were all set to do a retreat, and we had... Mm -hmm. um, sort of provisionally booked a venue and then of course that had to that had to stop um and we're still a bit hesitant um I'll just slight, sidetrack slightly so um i normally run polymania we've done six events i think and the last two were online um and i just i still don't feel confident enough in the situation to be able to put money in a hotel to to book teachers to travel it's right. still all just a bit uncertain yeah. and I, I just don't want the stress it was very very stressful um I had two events supposed to be happening just before, just as COVID sort of hit off and it was the most stressful time in my life there was a lot of money involved and um so much uncertainty and I, I just don't want to be there again so well actually I was going to ask you about that um to people who don't know, um, Cara has, um, were you the original originator of Polymania or did you work in cooperation with anyone? No, I was asked by um, Decaman, who are the European distributors of Cato Polyclay. Um, I work with them quite a lot um, mm -hmm. and I was sort of the Cato ambassador for the UK. And they said, we really want a workshop happening in the UK with Donna Cato, make it happen you can make it happen we've got right. faith in you and so I went okay and so I organized a workshop with Donna and that was the first Polymania um Donna that very, was in person in person yeah Donna very kindly said yeah sure I'll come and teach but only if you teach too and so the very first Polymania I taught all day and organized the event single-handedly which <laughs> was quite a headache um but we got through it and it was good and um I taught half a day the second year and then after that I decided it just you know whilst I love to teach it's teaching and organizing are both quite a handful and trying to do both at the same time is just more work than you need to do for one weekend. I can imagine I can very much imagine so you did you've been running the polymania events and just so everybody knows there were three day they were three day events originally yeah. um with Usually there were three teachers. Yep. And um, was it the same way we did it in Norwich, where we had the three teachers in one room and then they would just rotate? So you would be yeah. with one teacher one day, the next teacher the second day. So it's three one day classes, really. Yeah, they, they kind of modeled their event on what we were doing. So yeah, three one day classes. And I tried to always have, you know, a US, a European, and an English teacher was sort of how I originally sort of planned it. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't always work like that towards the end but that was that was my plan and yeah sort of really try and get a mix of projects and not beginner stuff um, and yeah they were really nice and we had it in a really nice hotel with a really nice lunch and it was lovely and I you know we will get back there but um, I'm not quite ready yet so you were you had planned for the one in early 20 you were starting the one in early 2020 because I know you were working on it because we had, we taught at Poly Anglia in 2019 in October. Yeah. And then, because I knew you were planning that. So then you had all of a sudden, oh no, you taught with Carol. That's right. Carolina had, you did, that's right. Um, Donna and I were in Sweden uh, at Carolina's event. At Nordic Poly Camp. Right. And we did we 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 flew back and it was the freakiest thing ever because we were worried about, you know, having to sit near people on the plane. But the nearest person on the plane was three meters in every direction. The plane was more or less empty. The airport was dead. 
it was so weird and we got home and my event was supposed to be the week after the, the polymania and we were the uk numbers were rising and we were just really uncertain about what to do um and it sort of i think it was the wednesday before we should have started the event on the friday we decided we just couldn't go ahead my son had come home from school with covid and i was having to isolate and I was just really worried about all the oh, participants yeah. coming, a lot of them sort of a bit older and the travel. And so, so the very last minute we moved it online. So the poor teachers who had signed up to come and have a lovely time in a hotel and, you know, been taken out for dinner and all the, all the, all the sort of joys that that brings suddenly were like, OK, we're going to do this online. So they had to work it's out the video long. technology and it was um, interesting few days, but we did it. And we didn't really Zoom. we didn't know about zoom then we used uh, right. facebook live which of course you don't get the the people having to type messages and right the, it's not a, it's not two way yeah no. yeah yeah and it's funny to even think about just that recently just over two years ago we it was unheard of to do things virtually and now we're we're, we're virtual all the time we don't think anything of it. We meet all the time. Nice. So it's just interesting. Interesting. So the biggest changes that COVID brought, I would say, are going virtual. Yeah. Has yeah. that been a big is that has that been a difficult transition for your members? Um I think it it, it was a little bit difficult to start with. Um we did a lot of um documents about how to how to get onto zoom how to use the chat how you know we mm -hmm. we sort of email those out to people um and it's yeah the first few were a bit clunky and awkward and and now we've we've got it down quite pat and it just it means that those people who could never make meetings could come it means that people who join us from around the world can come it means we can all just meet and have a great time and then go away rather than having to drive and stay in a hotel and it, it just gives us very different opportunities so i think probably we will continue to do a lot of stuff online as the british polymer clay guild um i we talked about maybe trying to do some sort of blended things where we're we have an in-person meeting and we offer zoom and, and when we get back to in-person meetings i think we'll try that so that those people who are more remote can still join us but say so we haven't we haven't quite brave some of the, the local groups have started meeting again because they're smaller they tend to be sort of 10 to, well i think a lot of the groups probably only four or five people that meet regularly and maybe change of numbers um and some of them are sort of 10 20 people so that's easier numbers um so they are some of them are meeting but um yeah i think gotcha. the, the online thing will serve as well i think um i noticed uh joseph has a question yes uh thanks ginger uh, cara my name is joseph barbaccia and um i i had never gotten into polymer clay that deeply until recently and um, I noticed that uh, we talk very positively about the um, wider range that organizations have uh, because of uh, because of electronics, say, and Zoom or, or Skype or, or whatever we choose to use. And I've also heard, and you might agree that something is lost in the translation working uh, between working personally on a one-to-one -one basis uh, versus what we're doing now. Um, and I was wondering in your experience, do you have any suggestions about how some of that personalization could be brought back through the medium we now use? That's a great question and that is something I feel quite strongly about because from a teaching point of view it a zoom class you I think you actually get better teaching value out of it than you do a real class because you've got a perfect view all the time 
you're in your own surroundings you've got every tool you ever needed probably if you're anything like me you've got every tool you might ever need just behind you rather than when you go you know you, you've gone in your bag and, oh I left that at home mm-hmm. you don't have the benefit of being able to borrow stuff from other people but I think the, the zoom workshop from a from a learning point of view is is almost more valuable than a real life but it really misses out on what this what we don't go to workshops just for the learning we go for right. the the social aspect we go for the networking we go you know when you walk around the room and you see something someone's got and you go wow that's amazing what did you you know where did you get that um what we've tried to do with when i run my polymania event online and with the guild is we try and make sure we've got social time built in that we've got time where people can chat so we always do lunchtime we'll set up some breakout rooms we'll make sure we put some breaks in and put breakout rooms because you can't chat you know if you've got 20 people on a zoom you can't all chat but we, if we put some breakout rooms in then people can and we sort of you know freely people can move freely between them it, it gives an opportunity to talk um we've tried to do some sort of more fun things as well so when we do our, our guild agm we're going to do a bit of a quiz and i've i've done that with polymania too where people are doing voting and polling and answering questions and then we can sort of talk about it a bit just to get a bit more of rather than being a sort of passive sat there listening to try and get people interacting a bit more. Mm-hmm. But I think, yeah, th- there must be something more we can do, but I think that the main thing we've tried to do is to, is to build in that social time. And when, when other people have run, I, I've sort of hosted workshops for a couple of people. They've asked me to help them with the Zoom. I've done a lot of Zoom. Um, I host all the Guild workshops, um, a lot of muting, 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 um, but <laughs> it's just, I think it's it, it and I try and say just I really think it's important if you put the breakout rooms and nobody chooses to use them that's fine but I think it's important to give people that opportunity to connect and if you have the breakout rooms it means people can go and they can have two or three people they can actually have a proper conversation whereas you know when you've got 20 people you'll have a couple of people having a conversation and everybody listening so that's my best suggestion so far and um, thank you um I I have uh, attended a, a Zoom uh, meeting of artists and we talk about other artists and two things that we do during that meeting, once, in the be- once at the very beginning, and that has to do with having a drink. Now you could obviously drink anything you want to, but people say, well, I'm having, you know, gin and tonic or, mm-hmm. you know, I'm having this. And so you, you have drink. And that's how it starts. And then it gets formal. We talk about a particular artist. Sometimes that artist is interviewed, things like that. And uh, another one has um, where you might have um, a little nosh, you know, something something to kind of eat and you, and you introduce the, uh, the whatever you're eating nosh, you know, something like that. Um, and those two things help one break the ice and you get a little personal time back and forth with both of those. Um, so just as an example uh, for those other really, really uh, good Zoom suggestions. Yeah, really good suggestions. Did, um, yeah, it, it, it's calorie, you know, it's calories, so that's bad. But, <laughs> you know. Well, I think that's a really good point, actually. Um, not the calories, but the fact that you have to adapt. You have to do things differently. You have to, we have a different, we have a different set of circumstances and a different set of tools. So um, one of the things that I noticed that was happening right away um, with COVID when we started switching to virtual workshops is that there has always been a, um, polymania was a bit different because that you would have three one day with one teacher but there but for a long time the traditional thing has been one teacher all weekend so you have two eight hour days or even three eight hour days which if what you're doing is social and you're you're sitting around talking while you're working it works but if you're on zoom for eight hours it can become quite tedious and i noticed that a lot of the workshops that we had happening right after covid started um, th- what people did is just converted directly to video rather than changing how the entire structure worked of the teaching experience. 
So what have you found about that? I, I've i noticed, um, and, and I totally understand why it happens, that, that teachers almost try to, they try so hard to give value for money and they try so hard to put so much in there, but it does mean that you are sat there for eight hours working, working, working. Whereas I think it's much better if you can. So, um, I mean, I don't tend to sort of dictate how teachers work and we'll discuss it and I'll, you know, and we'll, we'll sort of how they want to run it. But actually sometimes it works quite nicely if they, do a demo and then the same as you would in a workshop they do a demo and then you leave space to work whereas often teachers just keep demoing effectively mm -hmm. and it's amazing value and you get so much learning but it is tiring and you and and then it constricts the time to talk as well whereas if you do a, a demo and then okay now you've got 10 minutes to do it in that 10 minutes people can chit chat um and and that helps but I've kind of lost where your question was there. That's fine. That's fine. So um, I'll move on to another topic. Um, oh, no, I turned blurry there. Um, another topic. So groups often wither due to one person doing all the work. Um, and usually not due to the fault of the leader. That is, it, it just it's, it needs to get done. And you ask for help, and you know one person ends up doing it all. So how do you manage to get? Um, how do you manage to get so many great volunteers? What's your secret? Um, luck, <laughs> being very nice, uh, asking people very nicely, Jennifer. <laughs> if we sort of went, please, please, please come and help us. Um, so I, I try very hard to be understanding about people's lives as somebody who is very busy and struggles to fit everything in. And so there's never any, you know, you said you would do this, why haven't you done it? Um, because I, you know, I understand life gets in the way. Um, I think we, because we, because we've been kind of doing good stuff and I think that almost makes it easier because people want to be a part of it um and i know before so we, we went through a stage where we had quite a few different presidents over time just because you know people people find themselves in the role when they didn't really mean to and then it's an awful lot of work and they realize they they just don't have time for it and they move on and everybody did something and everybody made their mark and everybody kind of improved something but they, they would sort of start off with great enthusiasm and then it all sort of dwindles and um I've been quite lucky I say I think it largely it's the timing the COVID thing has really made a difference it's I, I think you know Lisa who was the president before if she had stayed she would have moved things in the same way right, because, right. because of the technology I don't I don't think it's you know I don't think I can just go oh yeah it's not it's not really I, just the timing that the way we've changed things has has been what's made it easy to grow and, and to build it but there's a few of the volunteers who've been um there's one in particular who for a long time did three roles on the committee um and so basically without her the the guild wouldn't have carried on and so one of the first things we did was try and take some of that away from her because while she was prepared to carry on doing it, it's just, it's it's too much. Um, I'm conscious that my web, my, my sort of social media team have too much and I want to get some more help for them because I hear noises, they're starting to, you know, I'm struggling to it's do it. It's a lot of work. And really so, yeah. yeah, just trying to sort of share the work around and I do do quite a lot um, and I pick up the slack where somebody can't, I pick up the slack. Um, and there will come a time when I won't be able to do that and we'll need somebody else. But, you know, I have got a great team and they do, they, they mainly pull their weight and they all have their different skills and they all contribute in their different ways. And, you know, we have fun and we have meetings and we have 
fun meetings and we're really looking forward to actually being able to get together at some point and have a and you know we need to have an actual physical meeting where we can all be together and, and actually you know go to that the was actually my together. next my next question are you meeting um you said that the smaller groups the smaller guilds are meeting yeah. in person but is the is the guild at large meeting in person yet not yet um we unfortunately we used to have a, a few venues that we used which are no longer available to us mm. it's kind of difficult because there isn't anywhere you know london is way in the south and we've got members in scotland uh if we go somewhere further north it's there just there isn't any kind of really obvious place to meet so I, I think once we start to do meetings again we'll try and move them around a little bit yeah, um, and, try and, and try and offer zoom join in too for people right so yes. is there still a place do you think of course this is opinion but um do you think there's still a place for in-person teaching back to the teaching thing yeah i think so um I fully intended to embrace online teaching when COVID started and uh, then just haven't had the haven't had the steam to do it with everything else, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very much looking forward to uh, seeing all my friends again, you know, mm. the, my Paula McClay friends I meet at events. Um, and I've seen them on Zoom, but it's not quite the same. I'm, I, I look forward to being in a room full of people and being able to hug people and and touch their clay and see their pieces up close and I think I think I think we will have less of those now I think there will be more zoom teaching and I think that's probably a good thing as long as we can get the social thing in it a bit more mm -hmm. um, but I think there's I think there's a place for both it's that it's that connection and the socializing and, and the networking really isn't the same on zoom you know when when we were in Norwich together we were you know planning on all sorts of things and we, we came up with all sorts of ideas which we just wouldn't get right, right. In this scenario we'd get some right. of that but not some of the more crazy ideas only come when you're sat in the bar I think I think that's actually quite true um I know we sat and talked for hours and hours and hours <laughs> so and I miss that I miss that because you yeah, it's harder on Zoom. So if someone is considering teaching, what advice would you give them in this current environment? Preparation, always. Um, online or, or in real either, life? Either, either, because it's a different paradigm now. Hmm. You don't have, if you're teaching in person, you're going to have fewer people who are willing to travel and willing to go just because of COVID. Um, if you're teaching virtually, you're no longer localized. So you have many more options, but like we've already discussed, there's, there's limited with the social aspects. Yeah. So it's, so what would, what, what advice would you give to somebody thinking about diving into this? Uh, so my biggest bugbear is always like, you have to master what you're teaching before you teach it. That's, you know, it, it mm -hmm. doesn't mean to say that you need to be the world's best, but you have to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so if I was asked to teach somewhere, I would come up with a project and then I would work it and work it and work it. And I would work out all the ways it would go wrong and what the solution is to that and then you turn up and you teach and you think it's okay i know everything that could go wrong and then within five minutes 20 students have found something else something new and, yeah, yeah. and you learn a whole lot more um so i think you know that's i one of the things i enjoy most about teaching is is sort of the opportunity to learn as well because you always learn a lot and it's sort of being open to that and um being open to the fact that that whilst you hopefully know a bit more than the most of the people in the room there will be people in the room who will come up with a different way and just because your way is this way isn't always the right way it's not the right way for everybody and sometimes somebody will say why don't you do it like this and you go i just never thought and that is genius and i'm going to do yeah. that from now on you know just yeah. Kind yeah, of, i've had that happen yeah, yeah I, I thought i was so smart and then somebody else oh yeah yeah and then you just go why didn't I think of that that was so obvious but just yeah. you do it the way you've always done it and you did it because somebody else showed you that and that was mm -hmm. 
But yeah, and I guess it's just um, if you're if you're going to do a Zoom thing, then it's thinking about how the day is going to work and thinking about the timings. And you can never tell how the timings are going to go because you think it will take ten minutes and it takes an hour, and having a sort of contingency for that. Mm -hmm. So what mistakes, this is a touchy one. So what mistakes have do what mistakes have you seen people make? Or yeah. No names. No names. <laughs> so. Well, I'm I'm sure I've done plenty too. Oh, um, we all have, yeah. But what are some what are some things to look out for? If you're if if you know somebody um, I, who I wants to teach. One of the things that I find happens to me all the time is I really prepare and think about what I think are going to be the difficult parts. And the bits that I think are going to be easy are often the bits where my class falls apart. And often it's right at the beginning. And it's partly just as everyone's settling in. And it's because I didn't think about that because that's, you know, I want you right. to do this this and this and to me that's so easy and straightforward and I'll you know if it's particular numbers I'll have given them a sheet or and then it they just can't do it for some reason and and then you're going why is this so difficult and it's just because I didn't prepare that bit because I was worrying about the bit down there that I thought was going to be difficult but often the beginning actually can be people kind of warm up and, and gaining confidence of their ability and their trust in you, I guess, to some degree. Um, and so as the workshop goes on, it gets easier, but that that first half an hour is often the most difficult. And it could be the simplest thing, you know, cut a triangle or a, cut a re rectangle five by six centimeters, and then you'll get people who just can't do it. And you go, it's just cutting a rectangle. Why can't you do it? And it's either the way you've explained it or it's just that they're not say they're not quite settled and so actually I think taking care at the beginning um, is important uh, something I'm sure I've done and I've seen a few other teachers do is miss something critical off the supply list uh, and then that's okay if it's something that can be borrowed or some something people might have but you know like okay get out your tube I don't have a tube yeah, you need a tube. That's that's always a little bit awkward. <laughs> not good, not good. Um, yeah, have plasters with you. If you don't have plasters, people will bleed. If you have plasters, generally it's okay because you've got that's the plasters, a, so you don't need them. <laughs> that's a good. That's a good. That's a really good point. Um, I see Joseph has another question. Yeah. Thank. Thank you. Um, I'm good. You, you mentioned earlier, Kara, about um, the difference, or, or you touched on the difference between uh, giving a demo and giving a class. And um, I'm going to be giving a demo uh, in August locally here to uh, an art group. And I don't know if they're specifically interested in polymer clay. Or they just want to see how one can create, um, in particular, the style I created. But uh, in the difference that uh, you stated, what would you, or I should say in the in the statement that you made, what would be the biggest difference in giving a, a demo versus teaching a class in approaching how you would address the attendees? Okay, so I think when you, I tend to, I mean, people run demos different ways. And I tend to think about a demo where you're, you're sharing something, but you're not expecting people to create along with you. Um, when you're running a workshop, you're, you're expecting that everybody, you know, at the end of the day, everybody will have made something similar to what, or using the skills you've taught them. Whereas a demo, you are sharing. So I think you, when you're, and that's probably what you'll be doing with the art group, isn't it? You'll just be, you'll just be showing them what you're doing and you'll be talking through what you're doing. So you'll probably give them slightly different information because if I need somebody to, to work alongside me, I need to give them a bit more detail about the 
it needs to be this size, you need to do it this way, whereas you wouldn't need to give that information in a demo because they wouldn't be following along, but you might want to give more information about why you're doing something. Um, or you might want to talk more about sort of the process more generally rather than the sort of the nitty gritty bits that people would need to follow along. Does that make sense? It does. And thank you. And thank you for doing this talk too. I really appreciate it. And thank you too, Ginger. Oh, sure, My sure. pleasure. So that's actually a good point to ask for questions. Does anybody have any questions? I'm going to take us off spotlight. Okay, Sandy. I, I see you there. Yeah. Hi, Kara. My name is Sandy Nigro. I'm from Portland, Oregon in the US. I'm very interested in global groups. And I was signed up. I was going to sign up for the British Polymer Play Group. And then I realized that the meeting times were not um, conducive to me joining because it would have been like the West Coast. So uh, it would be like 1, 2 AM. And you know that wouldn't be any fun. Do you have meetings? When are your meetings and how often do you Zoom? Okay, we don't have any fixed meeting schedule. Um, we tend to, uh, we did try doing sort of social Zooms for a while and during lockdown we did that a bit, but now people are too busy to just come along for a chat for no reason. So we tend to do workshops and we just do those when we've got something lined up. So. We've actually got a Zoom next Wednesday um, with Nadia, I've forgotten her surname. She's um, a miniaturist and she was on a TV show in, in the UK recently. And so we're going to have a Zoom with her talking about how the TV show went and about her miniatures. So that will be an evening one, um, just mm -hmm. because it'll be a short one. So that'll be eight o'clock in, in the evening, um, British summer time. And then we've got one in the autumn planned um, with one of our members who does amazing work, Helen Crookshank. And we've got our AGM, which will be from 10 o'clock in the morning through till five o'clock at night. So they're all, generally they are in the daytime of, on a weekend because that's when most people are free, but we do record most things. We don't record everything. Yeah. Um, some teachers don't want things to be recorded or sometimes it's not appropriate, but we do try and make a recording available to people. Well, I need to go in and look again at your workshops because I think it would be fun to um, to join a, another country's group, you know, and um, and we really appreciate when we have people from Europe and other parts of the world join us. It's just fun. Um, but I didn't realize that <clears throat> now your 8 p.m. workshop would actually work out for me. So I need to go back on and and look at your um, your site. Yeah. You know, I don't, now you say that, I don't think we've got, we do have an events page, but I don't think any of our upcoming, our own events are actually on there yet because the Zoom one, I've only just confirmed, the one next week, I've only just confirmed the date yesterday and our October one isn't on there yet. It's going to go on soon, but we don't, yeah, we must get our, when we've got a date in mind, we must get it on our website soon so people can see it. Oh, Thank you for letting us know that. <laughs> so what is, what is the web, what is the URL for the website? Um, it's, I will put it in the chat, it's bpcg.org.uk. Um, and so we've got the, um, our 25th birthday celebrations on the 25th of September, um, and that will be from 10 till five. So we've got a variety of things planned. Um, we've got Ginger coming to talk to us. Um, we're gonna have, uh, so the morning will just be a sort of play along social so people can come and play along and chat or just come and chat if they want to. And we'll have breakout rooms. Um, then I'm gonna do a welcome and presidential address, which will be the highlight of the day, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> We've got Sue Heezer who started the Guild. She's gonna come and give a little talk about the history of the Guild. And we'll, we've got plenty of breaks built in. We're gonna have a little chat with community experts. So we've got um, 
Ginger and Amy from the IPCA and Lucy who runs the sort of polymer week community coming and we, th we thought it'd be really nice to talk about how important polymer community is and, and I'm sure our conversation will be a, along the sort of online in-person thing as well. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to release to our members a, a video tutorial that Donna Cato has prepared for us ahead of that and then we've got a live Q&A with Donna which will be possibly about the video if people want to or just general play questions with Donna. And then we'll have our AGM and we've got a massive prize giveaway. Unfortunately, the prizes will be limited to people in the UK. And we're going to finish off with a polymer clay quiz, which will be one of those interactive. You'll have to sort of, um, I did one before. It's quite fun. It's like trying to guess which show you a color and you've got to guess, you know, what, which brand and what its name Ooh. is or a piece of polymer clay art and you've got to guess who the artist is uh, or in oh, fact we did have a bit of sort of very close up zoomed in pictures of polymer clay artists and trying to work out who they were it's kind of quite fun so if nothing else come and join us for the quiz at the end so is this going to be open to the public yeah it's open to or everybody. just to members oh, no, good, good, open good. to everybody um we decided it was a celebration and it would be great to have as many people there as possible so it's if you're thinking about uh, checking out what we do, it'd be a good opportunity to come and come and meet some people in the UK and uh, yeah, see what we do. We'll, we'll, we will publish, um, the, we're sort of building a, a new page on the website with some details about it and we'll have some stuff on the social media about it and we'll share a Zoom link. I'll perhaps share a Zoom link in the Insiders um, so that you can all come along if you want to. Good, good, good. So is the Guild membership open to people not in Britain? It is, yes. Um, so you can't have all the same benefits that you have in the UK. We don't post anything overseas, which means most prizes aren't open and we've got a, a library of books and DVDs that we don't share. But we do um, welcome people from overseas. So it's okay if we spell color without the U, is that right? Yeah, we won't correct your spelling. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we've, I mean, we've got a members group and actually some of our most active members in our members, we've got a private Facebook group for members, which I say uh, Debbie posts something every day, more or less in there. And um, some of our most active people are our international members, actually. I, I guess if they've, they're keen enough to have joined us uh, from overseas, maybe they're... Uh, just generally a bit more keen but it's it's good 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 awesome were there any more questions phyllis um this isn't really a question but a suggestion something i learned when i was leading a large group is that when you're looking for volunteers and you ask and nobody says anything nobody raises their hand it's, it really helps to ask individuals if they can do a small task because people tend to think, oh, somebody else will do it. And then so they don't volunteer. And, and it also helps um, like CAR has to have committees so that they're not doing it by themselves. So they have people to, to, um, to lean on, to interact with, those kind of things I have found help. Thank Good you. advice, thank you. In fact, actually, that was one of the changes I made was I made teams. So before we had a, a membership person and a social media person and I made I made teams. And the idea is that if the person who so there is one person in each team who does the bulk of the work, but should they be having a bad time, they could just say, I can't do it this week. Could somebody else pick that up? Um, the idea, well, it, it, it happened because we lost a couple of people and then we lost knowledge and we just didn't know what we were doing. So by having the team, it gives me that sort of sense of security that if the main person walks away, somebody else has a bit of a clue about how the membership works, because it's not fun trying to work it out when you don't know. But yeah, that's, a, I mean, that's a good idea. And, and um, you know, asking, asking people directly, we've kind of done a little bit of that, people that we like and, and we can see have got a skill that might be useful and it's, yeah, try not to burden anybody too much. But yeah, if you ask for volunteers, it's like tumbleweed silence. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, and any other questions? No, Jennifer. 
saved a really tricky one for me, has she? <laughs> no, it's not a question. It's an observation. Cara, you're extremely uh, humble about what you do. Um, you don't take the credit for what you've done, but people in the Guild have seen it. And it's definitely you that's changed everything for it. And I know that there were circumstances, but you took those circumstances and ran with them and made it more uh, accessible to everybody. You know, but like you said, it was like Tumbleweed before. Um, I, there was a point when I didn't even know why I joined because I was expecting this, well, what it is now, and it wasn't. And it's since you took on the membership, the leadership, that things move, things change, you get things done. So you should take a little bit more credit for that. It's well deserved. And it's not just people in the guild that see it, people yeah. outside the guild see it too. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Any but other you do too much. That, that has to be said. I do, you know, like we all try and do our bits, but if none of us will do that, you take it on. Yeah, so maybe you should stop that. doing that. Yeah. I think that's a a, a common problem. Yes. Bertha. <laughs> so, <Yeah>. <clears throat> Oops. Hello. Hello. Hi. Sorry, trying to never get my thing open. Um, hi. Um, I care. I I know. Um, I know what you mean because I I a similar thing where I'm now president of my guild in a very similar <laughs> circumstance to what you have. It's a much smaller guild. <laughs> it's about the tenth the size of, of yours, but um, uh, so I understand. Same amount of work, uh, the, I imagine. About the same amount becoming of becoming <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, pretty much the uh, same way. Um, but, uh, and I know we've definitely been um, experimenting with the high, what we were calling hybrid meetings, you know, in person and, and Zoom. And um, I know other groups, it's almost like, I feel like presidents of various guilds um, need to like schedule a symposium <laughs> where we talk about how to our experiences and what we've learned and, and share ideas uh, and best practices for doing, because we're all sort of fumbling around trying to figure out the best way to get the interaction going because it almost has become a little bit of two camps. There's people who really don't want anything to do with technology and they want to meet in person. Um, but sometimes when you arrange it, they're still not coming. And then uh, you have people who just like, I like sitting, I like sitting in my, workroom in my pajamas in our meetings you know so I want to keep with the zoom you know sir or they've joined and they live differently you know, we've had a couple who who've who've moved away and a couple have developed health issues and they still want to stay very active and zoom has enabled them so yeah it's definitely um I, I think it's something but I think it, it really does seem like we need to have get together and share what we've learned that's actually about a really how these good oh, that's a really good uh, point there is, because Amy's just set one up for the IPCA. The, the I, so if you're an IPCA member, yes, they've set, they've set up a Guild President's Facebook group where we can connect and we had a Zoom. So I'll get you hooked into that. Um, I don't know if I send your name over to Amy and say, get her hooked in. Yes, she, yeah, she, she knows um, who I am. I know Amy, so uh, yeah. And that, unfortunately, I'm not on Facebook, so. Um, I don't see anything there, but um, because I know me, yeah, if having a Zoom thing and Amy can, um, and I've told her now I am now president, so she knows. But but Does I that think mean, that would be something to. It's a good idea. That would, be, that would be cool. Yeah. Yeah, we should all help each other because I'm sure we're all having the same, the same issues. And and actually, something I I didn't talk about earlier, because I was I was thinking. You know, I knew Ginger wanted to sort of talk about how the, how the Guild had grown. And actually what I realised was some of the things that helped the Guild grow, we got a new website in 2017 and that saw a massive increase in members when we got the new website. And then we did another new website in 2021 where we did, we've got a, a sort of automatic membership thing and it's all a lot easier. Um, and again, we saw a massive influx of members. And I think having a 
having a good website it's a lot of work um, mm -hmm. but having a website and have it that's accessible that's got information on it that makes people feel it's worth being a part of I mean I, I was the same as Jennifer and I didn't for a long time I I was a member of the guild because I felt like, like I ought to be but I didn't really understand like what am I getting from it and that's partly what's driven me is like if I'm paying money to be part of this I want you know I want to get some value from it and um but yeah having having the website and having the social media that's that's what's helped us grow that's where we've we've reached people and I think it's we're good. lucky we've got a big audience we've got the whole of the UK I know if you're a if you're in a, a smaller regional guild or you know in, in the US I think you've got sort of more smaller pockets to work with and it's trying to reach people locally is a bit harder but well yeah, I'm I think... also the webmaster for us for a guild so and right. and it was a big help I set it up that we can make um, membership due payment you know online using PayPal so you know, that that definitely has made things a lot easier for collecting dues and things like that but yeah the other yeah the, that's another issue that would be interesting to talk to is what do people expect from guilds mm -hmm. or you know really I mean that I think that just happens with all kinds of groups it's like what are people looking for mm -hmm. and um yeah. maybe all they want to be is passive and that's why they're being passive they don't want to be active they just want to kind of observe you know or something and if that's what they want or is it something they they're holding off because we're not giving them something yeah you know, well there's there a lot of issues I, yeah. I can say that it's that you have to fight the tendency to be all things to all people yeah and that is something that can be quite challenging so yeah we've noticed um the younger people, because we've we sort of tried to engage with some of the the sort of younger polymer clay people, the the sort of earring sellers on Instagram. We've sort of tried to engage with them a bit, and they really aren't interested in 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 our community. They've got their own community. Um, they've got a community of other sellers or a community on Instagram. And I I think for me, the value of the guild is providing that sense of community to our members. It, it's a place you can go to to ask questions. It's a place where you can talk with like-minded people it's a place you can get information um but they're just not that you know that's not for everybody and and that whole sort of word word world guild world yeah yeah word guild is a sort of funny word isn't it and you you know it's for a lot of people it's just like well, what's this about why would i want to be a part of it absolutely absolutely well i think um I'll wrap things, time to wrap things up. Um, unless, were there any more questions? Okay. Um, thank you, Tara. Thank you so much for, it's a good, it's an interesting topic. Lots of, lots of things to think about. It's not uh, a flashy topic, <laughs> but it's a topic that affects a lot of us. So. Yeah, thank you to those of you who've come and given that part of your day and yes thank you evening thank you. here but i guess it's not evening for most of you no no it's it's actually cooled down here in the midwest so probably gonna head outside and enjoy it so thank you so much for being here everyone and thanks again cara and i'll have the recording up later yeah thank, thank you, you.